Good afternoon, everybody. What happened? Okay. No, I, I, I'm having a audio problem. I can be heard, right? Yes, you can be heard. Good afternoon, everybody. So, um, uh, welcome back to the Ayuka Thursday uh, colloquium at four o'clock. Uh, we've gone into a new mode from um, August, where we are now doing the the colloquium every other week instead of every week, which we had done from April. And uh, that leaves uh, alternate weeks uh, um, uh, free for us to do more specialized seminars rather than have the more general colloquium. So we will aim to have uh, uh, an event every Thursday at four o'clock, but uh, the colloquium that we've been doing from now on is going to happen every other week. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy to welcome back uh, uh, Biman Nath, Professor Biman Nath from the Raman Institute. Um, uh, a lot of you, of course, know Biman uh, in, in many uh, ways uh, um, in person. Biman, uh, of course, did his uh, PhD from the Muni uh, University of Maryland and uh, was here in Ayuka uh, as a postdoctoral fellow at a time when I was here in the 1990s. And I fondly remember the the many evenings at the National Film Archives and, uh, and, um, and all the food, et cetera. Um, uh, we, uh, Viman has this amazing streak in him of um, having uh, also being extremely culturally conscious in addition to his very innovative astronomy that he does. Uh, and that has uh, led him uh, after Ayuka to the Raman Institute, of course, where he is now a professor, but uh, he leads a parallel life in which uh, he's uh, you know, one of the country's uh, foremost science popularizers, uh, popularizers having won many awards. He writes uh, not just uh, popular um, science in both English and in Bengali, where he's won awards for writing um, um, very rare, uh, fantastic Bengali books of, of uh, science and astronomy. But also uh, he has made an amazing foray into fiction writing and, uh, uh, and, and has, uh, really won uh, quite a lot of accolades for that. Um, and in addition, his uh, foray into science history led to a very, very commendable book on the history of, say, the discovery of helium, which was published by Springer. So Biman is a multifaceted person. And, and of course, uh, in parallel, he has kept up his uh, wonderful work on, um, uh, on mainstream astrophysics, uh, uh, his work on clusters and, and EGN feedback, uh, et cetera, was, uh, very uh, well received over the last decade or so. And now he says that he is, is going to uh, give a talk on something that we might find rather controversial. Let's have a look. Neon signs, Biman. Let's see, be quiet. Do I mute it? Um... Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, fine. Uh, thank you, Shabak, for the kind introduction and Kandu for the invitation to the Colloquium series at Ayuka. Um, I suppose uh, the title of my talk may have come as a surprise to most of you because I have been working mainly on outflows from galaxies, uh, intergalactic medium and intercluster medium. Um, the why I have come to talk about cosmic ray acceleration in our galaxy is as a story of backward engineering, really. While uh, studying intergalactic medium, I realized that one has to study the galactic outflows in detail. And while looking at outflows, I realized that one has to understand the dynamics of uh, gas dynamics of star clusters, because that's where um, the galactic outflows get launched, because you need supernovae explosions packed um, uh, together in space and time. And in that uh, aspect, I have been interested in the role of non-thermal pressures um, in star clusters, radiation pressure, cosmic ray pressure, uh, with the hope that uh, the knowledge that we'll gain from studying star clusters uh, would be useful for studying the, the role of non-thermal pressures in the large scale outflows from galaxies. And there we hit upon something interesting. Um, and so I would like to talk to you, tell you about some of the things that I've been doing for the last two, three years on star clusters as uh, uh, acceleration sites of uh, cosmic rays. Uh, this is work done with uh, uh, a next student, uh, Siddhartha Gupta, who is uh, now a postdoc in University of Chicago, Pratik Sharma at IIC, and David Eichler in Israel. And uh, these are based on basically some of these papers which have come out in the last couple of years. 
Um, and I hope um, you'll find something of beat in what I'm going to say, because some of the things that I'm going to claim and say will probably go against, not against, but uh, go beyond the standard paradigm of uh, cosmic ray acceleration. So let's uh, start with recapitulating um, the standard paradigm um, of cosmic rays. So the cosmic rays are high energy particles, we all know, nuclei, electrons, and uh, we were discovered uh, by Victor Hess here, uh, who went up in a balloon 17,000 feet above the ground. And with his uh, electroscope, he found that in the upper atmosphere, there are a lot of charged particles far beyond the influence of radioactivity on, on, on Earth. And so the source was uh, definitely extraterrestrial, which is why it's called cosmic rays. And the source of these uh, cosmic rays have been a mystery since the very beginning. Um, slowly a story emerged, especially after Fermi's suggestion that interstellar shocks can accelerate cosmic ray particles, maybe out of the, um, uh, the high energy tail of thermal uh, pool of the interstellar medium. And an obvious choice for the interstellar shocks which will accelerate cosmic rays were well, no remnants. And so this is the standard sort of argument that is given to us. There are many variations in the theme, but this is one. Uh, so from the flux, so this is the picture of multi-wavelength uh, uh, composite picture of supernova 1006. Um, so the flux of the cosmic rays uh, on Earth, uh, when you assume that it's relativistic particles, uh, it uh, tells you the energy density in our galaxy to be of the order of EV per cc. And then you assume a cylindrical volume of the galaxy, uh, 10 kiloparsec in radius, um, kiloparsec or so in thickness, that gives you a total energy of 10 to the 56 hertz or so. And then you consider nuclear reactions that these cosmic ray particles undergo with uh, interstellar medium particles, for example, in cosmic rays and proton in ISM would uh, break up the carbon ion into smaller, uh, maybe lithium or boron, uh, bo I've written boron here, or beryllium, and so these are secondary particles. And so the ratio of the secondary to primary particles in cosmic rays gives what is called a grammage. This is the total number of um, encounters, total number of uh, material, ISM material that is encountered by cosmic ray particles as they propagate. And it's not a straight way, it's a magnetized plasma and there are uh, irregularities there. So uh, they propagate in a uh, very, uh, a complicated manner. So the total uh, amount of ISM material that is encountered by cosmic ray, that's called grammage. That's called, uh, and, and that uh, is inferred from this secondary to primary ratio to be about 10 grams per centimeter square. And then you say that in ISM densities of the order of one atom per cc, which gives you what is called the residence time, about uh, 10, 20 mega years. So let me give you an analogy to bring this out. Uh, uh, you know, in when you go to a shopping mall, to a governmental store, they arrange the shelves in such a way, uh, that it's like a maze, you know, you get scattered from one shelf to the other shelf, uh, so that you know, get attracted to buy this and that. So that's like the nuclear reactions happening to the cosmic ray particles as they propagate in the magnetized interstellar medium. And in a, in a store, the more time you spend, the more you tend to buy. So you have the shop items are the secondary particles and the primary particle is the money in your wallet. And that increases with the shopping time, right? So uh, well, I'm a very boring shopper. So I, I know exactly what to buy. So I go exactly to that shelf and get out. So that's, uh, uh, but there are people who believe in retail therapy uh, when they come out of the shopping mall by looking at their number of bags, uh, that's the secondary particles to the, uh, and the money that they had primary, you can figure out the shopping time that they, uh, the time that they spend. So that's the residence time. And so the grammage somewhat is different from column density. Column density is what you would have had if the cosmic ray particles struggled straight. Uh, so uh, so that's, uh, that gives you a residence time. And then you divide the total cosmic ray energy uh, by the residence time, and you get a cosmic ray luminosity, about 10 to the power 41 arcs per second. And then you say, um, they, I know the star formation rate in our galaxy, and with an I, inter, um, IMF, I can find out the supernova rate. It's two to three per century. And we know that you know, each supernova has 10 to the power 51 arcs. And if I say 
10 uh, percent or, or thereabouts goes into accelerating cosmic rays then it implies a cosmic ray luminosity of 10 to the power 41 arcs per second i hope you can see my cursor um and which is uh, exactly what you uh, uh, get so this is the story the standard story why supernova remnants have been the obvious choice uh, of the interstellar shocks um, uh, that can accelerate cosmic rays uh, of course there are direct evidences for example you can see this is the x-ray optical composite a picture of supernova 1006 and on the right hand side uh, is also td um, in red uh, gamma rays and uh, blue is uh, x-ray so that you can see the gamma rays so the gamma rays come from cosmic ray uh, uh, interactions uh, proton and proton in ism that gives rise to pion pion decays into gamma rays so these are telltale signatures of cosmic ray acceleration in supernova uh, remnants and then you also look at the energy spectrum right so this is the flux uh, of cosmic rays in uh, over decades of energy um, and it's uh, remarkably a power law, um, uh, more or less e to the power minus 2.7. Uh, there are some features here and there. For example, there's uh, what people call a knee around 10 to the power 15, 16 EV, and there's an ankle around 10 to the power 18, 19 um, uh, EV. Uh, but if you leave aside all these uh, small features, uh, it's a remarkable uh, power law of 2 to the power minus 2.7. And Simple diffusive shock acceleration would, of course, uh, predict a d to the power minus two, but then a detailed modeling of other nonlinear effects uh, would uh, bring it to t to the power minus 2.3. Then you assume that the cosmic rays actually are diffusing out of the galaxy. And with the diffusion coefficient that increases with energy, and, and suppose you assume that it increases as a cube root of energy, then the high energy particles would leak out faster, and that would slowly steepen the spectrum and then you add this minus 1.3 uh, here, you'll get uh, close to the observed uh, spectral index of minus 2.7. The idea, the picture that we have is that of a leaky box. The acceleration sites are embedded in the disk of the galaxy. Because um, and this is how another picture of you know, cosmic rays uh, propagating from the source to the observer um uh, in a very complicated manner in a magnetized ism and once in a while depending on the energy cosmic rays leak out um and and give the spectrum that we see now at this point let me bring to your attention another set of energetic events in our galaxy has to do with uh, uh massive stars uh, stellar winds from massive stars it's a picture of wolf-like stars uh, a remarkable photo uh, picture of uh, taken by Hubble Space Telescope. Um, we don't really talk about, usually talk about stellar winds because they are not probably spectacular enough as, uh, or catastrophic enough as supernova remnants, as a supernova explosions. But they can pack in a lot of energy if you integrate over time. So for example, if you take the typical mechanical power of the stellar wind, that's of the order of 10 to the power 36 arcs per second. That's a, a pretty uh, good estimate. Uh, it's almost independent of the mass, so you can use this for you know, you know, estimating things. And they're active for a few million years, so the total energy budget can be a few times 10 to the power 50 or even 10 to the power 51 arcs, which is comparable to supernova energy of 10 to the power 51. You know. um, and people have noticed that back in the 80s, uh, but usually we don't talk about this, just like, you know, we, don't, we tend to ignore the slow burning diseases or illnesses like blood pressure or diabetes and what catches our attention uh, the catastrophic things like heart attacks but uh, stellar wind can pack in a lot of energy and uh, so this is noticed there have been other problems also one of the thorniest problems um, uh, okay well, there are other aspects that people noticed in stellar wind bubble um, stellar winds is that supernova shocks are useful for accelerating cosmic ray particles for about 10000 years till the set of taylor phase lasts uh, before it goes into weak uh, snowplow phase the stellar wind can uh, remain strong for a, a million years or, or more uh, so here's a picture of uh, a supernova uh, composite picture again it's a thin shell um, you can see and uh, let me take this opportunity to bring uh, show you the structure uh, typical structure of a wind driven bubble uh, and this goes back to uh, the classical papers in 1970s 
by Weaver, Castor, and McRae. And so this is the ambient uh, interstellar medium. And this is where um, uh, the wind uh, is coming out. It's uh, so continuous pumping of mass and energy. And so you have a forward shock here. Uh, it's a dense shell. And, uh, and as the stellar wind comes out, the, it gets uh, stopped. It's, it's terminated in a, uh, you can call it reverse shock or wind termination shock. I'm going to use the term wind termination shock. Um, and this is the shocked wind part. This is the shocked ISM part. And the two material meet, uh, uh, face uh, one another in the contact discontinuity with, with the pressure balance. So this is the hot gas region. Um, so this is the typical structure of a wind-driven bubble. Um, so let me show you some uh, animation here that, uh, uh, from Siddharth's 3D simulation. So on the left uh, uh, box, you'll see a, a zoomed in version of a star cluster. The only OB stars are shown, the massive stars, um, and they're randomly uh, distributed in space with a core radius of uh, one uh, part second or so. On the right hand side, you'll see slightly zoomed out, and on the bottom side, uh, bottom panel, you'll see a zoomed out version. So this is the uh, ambient medium. For here, this is a uniform medium. And you see, let me start this and then uh, stop it here. And the blue uh, color signifies stellar wind material, uh, which is shocking, which is going out against uh, the uh, red of the ambient interstellar medium. And the black portions show the shocks. So here's the forward shock. And then this is a contact is going to be two kinds of material facing the stellar wind. And in the inside also, you'll see a black portion. That is the wind termination shock. That's the wind getting shocked. So let me uh, show you uh, the whole thing. And at some point, the OV stars, uh, one of the, the, the most massive star is going to go supernova. And you'll see a pop there. Uh, um, so the wind is uh, coming out of these OV stars. And you can see this is the wind termination shock. right? And uh, around three and a half uh, million years, uh, you'll see uh, first supernova go off. Let me see. And you'll see that it's going to send ripples. Ah, there you, there you go. All right. So, so, uh, so the, uh, people, there have been motivations to go beyond the standard paradigm. And one of the uh, uh, phenomenological uh, um, clues have been from the secondary to primary radiation that I talked about earlier, but here is uh, energy dependence on that. So the secondary to uh, primary ratio here, boron to carbon ratio, it decreases with energy. And you can say that, okay, high energy particles diffuse out. So uh, the high energy particles see less of the material. So they produce less secondary. So that's why you see a fall off. But what you notice is that there is, a, it doesn't fall off, uh, it is a plateau. And so these and other things uh, led Cousin, uh, Wilson in, back in the 70s to talk about nested leaky box model, where you say that the diffusion property of cosmic rays is different inside the nest. Nests are the uh, star formation, the acceleration sites. And, uh, and, and the diffusion properties outside uh, in the ISM is different. And the idea is that most of the secondaries are produced inside these nests, and cosmic rays suffer most of the interactions inside this nest. In other words, the garbage is mostly accumulated inside this nest and not while propagating in the ISM at large. One of the thorniest problems uh, in the standard paradigm has been the light element problem. And uh, I talked about this spallation. Uh, uh, so this uh, cosmic ray spallation can explain the light element abundance today. And this has been a success story of uh, cosmic ray phenomenology back from uh, since 70s. Um, so there are two kinds of spallations, and one spallation creates light element particles in the cosmic rays, and then the inverse, uh, the direct spallation produces uh, light elements in the ISM. So anyway, but there are problems in explaining the light element abundance in early box. For example, when you look at uh, halo metal poor stars, um, the light element abundance uh, is not exactly what you uh, um, expect to be. If if you want them to be uh, uh, created out of produce out of cosmic ray spallation, because Cosmic rays, if they're accelerated out of ISM, then their ion abundance would scale as metallicity, Z. And uh, also the ISM particles, they are uh, ions uh, uh, are going to scale as metallicity. So the lithium, beryllium, boron abundance is going to scale as Z square. And so if we divide this metal, uh, lithium boron abundance by uh, Z, then that should scale linearly with Z. So here is a, 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 a data. 
this is beryllium and boron divided by iron for the proxy of uh, metallicity and against uh, metallicity. So what you expect is the dashed line, uh, which is linearly going up with Z. And what you see is that it's almost independent of Z. So what this uh, has been interpreted is in the cosmic ray particles should not be representative of the ambient ISM at the time of acceleration, but should be much richer in carbon and, op and oxygen. <clears throat> And so uh, the idea is that maybe some cosmic rays uh, are uh, accelerated out of the stellar wind material inside nests. And that brings me to the neon problem. If you look at the isotope ratios, or certain isotope ratios in cosmic rays and, in, and compare that to the solar uh, values, uh, you would notice that there, so the carbon, uh, um, nitrogen and uh, oxygen, they're subsolar because they uh, undergo a spallation. But the other isotope ratios are more or less solar, except the neon 22 to neon 20 ratio. That's almost five times the solar ratio, and it stands out and begs for an explanation. And well, it was noticed in back in 80s that uh, neon 22 is available in stellar winds and pre-supernova state stellar winds of uh, massive stars. And so you need to mix in some cosmic rays from stellar wind and the uh, cosmic rays uh, that has been accelerated by supernova remnants in the ISM. And uh, with some phenomenological mixing ratios, so this is uh, from Bing et al. data. Uh, people have uh, talked about this. Um, now, uh, and things sort of stood at this uh, stage for a while because there was no direct evidence of uh, cosmic acceleration in star clusters like we had for, uh, from supernova remnants until uh, uh, Fermi uh, uh, telescope discovered, uh, detected uh, gamma rays from uh, some of the uh, star forming star forming a uh, lot of substructures here in the signal, so we and this is uh, gamma GV uh, and also uh, uh, gamma ray 1 to um, 30 doradas uh, in LMC and then and they can the observers can uh, find out how many OB stars are there so the total also can estimate the total mechanical power of the stellar wind and they uh, provide a ratio of the gamma ray luminosity to the mechanical power of the wind uh, which you can think of as, as a sort of efficiency of uh, the the wind power uh, in, in converting into gamma ray. Right? And that ranges at about 0.1% to about a percent. For example, for 30 doradas, it's about a percent. For Westerloon 1, 2, this is slightly less than uh, 30 to the minus 3, a few times 20 to the minus 4. But, you know, roughly it's of that order. And I would like to keep you, uh, I'd like you to keep that in mind. We'll use these numbers later. Uh, even before, uh, we had gamma rays. There were some uh, telltale signs of uh, cosmic ray acceleration from the X rays. So this is a composite uh, multi wavelength picture of X rays from Tarantula Nebula, 30 doradas. Uh, blue uh, shows the X ray from Chandra. And what was seen is that the X ray emitting gas has lower temperature than expected, almost a factor of few. And the question is why? And uh, well, I mean, you know how to. Uh, model this, uh, let me uh, remind you that, you know, we talked about this uh, structure, a typical structure of wind-driven bubble, and most of the uh, X-ray comes from this yellow, hot and dense region, the shocked wind part. Uh, so between the wind, wind termination shock and the uh, discontinuity. Yeah? And you can, uh, you can model this pretty uh, uh, in detail. Uh, you can include cooling, you can include thermal conduction, uh, but even then that doesn't help, seem to help. Um, and I'm sure some of you uh, uh, are thinking that there, there was a similar problem with the supernova remnant also. In supernova remnants, you see the X-ray temperature is slightly less than what you expect. And this has been solved by uh, saying that you know, supernova remnants uh, accelerate cosmic rays, so you expect cosmic rays to be there. And so some of the, you know, the energy density budget is going to be shared between thermal and cosmic ray pressure. And that's going to lessen the burden on the thermal gas. I mean, if I have limited resources and I've got two establishments to run, my expenditure uh, for uh, each uh, establishment will be less than uh, what I had if I had only uh, one establishment to run. So that's going to decrease the X-ray luminosity. Well, it's, uh, the idea is simple, but uh, it's difficult to uh, do it for the case of uh, stellar wind because 
the structure of the stellar wind bubble is uh, fundamentally different from blast waves, which is, you know, uh, you dumped in the energy at one uh, point in space and time. And here you are continuously pumping in energy. So the structure, structure is different. And it's not amenable to uh, self-similar solutions of uh, cosmic ray profile as uh, Chevalier did. Um, but uh, we had a brilliant student, uh, Siddhartha Gupta. Um, we were thinking of this problem and we were almost on the verge of giving up. Um, and he went home for puja vacation one day, uh, once, uh, and then came back with uh, uh, with a, a two fluid code. So before he went home, we were banging our head against the wall on this problem. And after he came back, we had a fully uh, uh, working machinery to play around with. And so uh, there are uh, uh, complications here that I don't want to get into. For example, the CR, uh, cosmic ray diffusion, it goes ahead of the shocks and it changes the shock structure. And there's a whole subject of two fluid shocks that we uh, studied and uh, had to understand. And uh, so Trudy and Folk, they uh, talked about the, what they call the global smooth solution uh, of cosmic ray profile without any discontinuing the cosmic ray pressure. And uh, later Becker and Kazanas showed that, you know, it's only possible for uh, certain Mach numbers um, and we, uh, for the first time, we numerically confirmed these uh, studies. Um, so for in, in a stellar wind uh, uh, case, we have three regions where cosmic rays can exhibit it. You have the forward shock, and you have the wind termination shock, and you also have the central region where the, all the OB stars are there, uh, and the uh, winds from uh, individual OB stars are merging there, and so there'll be a lot of internal shocks, so we can get acceleration of cosmic rays there, also, so we have to take all of these into account. And so again, I'll show you a, a 3D simulation here. So now we were getting more ambitious. This is not a, a, a uniform uh, ambient density. It's a density profile of one of our R um, that you see in molecular clouds. Um, and so it's a zoomed in uh, version of uh, uh, the stellar positions of OB stars. And uh, on the right hand side, this is the density slides. And on the right hand side, I'll show an emission measure map. On the bottom panel, uh, as a function of time, you'll see in green the wind power and in red the mass loss rate. And you'll see a vertical bar going from left to right. And around three and a half million years, you'll see the first uh, supernova go off. Again, you'll see uh, you, the red, uh, the blue color will be for stellar wind meteor. And you'll see the uh, wind termination shock. So let me start. And um, as time goes, you'll see this is the forward shock. And this is the wind termination shock has formed here. And then after a while, now this is the first supernova will go off. Yeah, first supernova. And then the supernova will go off one after another. The wind termination shock, as you can see, gets momentarily disrupted, but it reforms. And um, so on the right hand side is the emission measure map. And for the heck of it, that I've put in uh, the optical uh, picture of the parental nebula on the right hand side. Um, now, so this is the temperature density map um, of at two different times uh, uh, up uh, the panel is for uh, earlier time and then five mega years later on the bottom in this panel on the left hand panel uh, if it, uh, what you have only when you have cooling so the temperature that you expect is of the x-ray gases about 10 to the power 8 kelvin then you include thermal conduction temperature drops to about 10 to the power 7 then you include cosmic rays and then temperature drops to about a few million degrees which is what is observed and so basically we confirmed uh, th this led to uh, uh, the uh, thinking that you know uh, this is a signature of cosmic rays being accelerated and then we looked at uh, gamma ray um, i don't want to spend too much time on this because i want to get into the neon problem which i find more interesting but uh, i should take you tell you about the gamma rays because well, there are uh, different cases if the, uh, if the cosmic rays are accelerated in the central region, in the wind termination shock, whether it's hadronic gamma rays or the leptonic, because there's a lot of uh, ionizing photons being uh, um, radiated by the OV stars. And if the size of the wind driven bubble is small, the radiation energy density is very high. So cosmic electrons can inverse quantum scatter uh, into gamma ray, these photons. Um, then we played around with uh, thermal conduction to be on and off. So I'll just give you two examples here. For example, this is X-ray surface brightness, and um, on uh, so for example, if the cosmic uh, thermal conduction, this is one fluid, this is two fluid. So on the bottom panel, if you just see these two figures, in one case um, 
uh, if uh, the cosmic rays are accelerated in the central region, if the cosmic rays are accelerated in the um, in the shocks and uh, wind turbulence shock. The bottom line is this: we looking at the gamma ray and the X ray and also the radio we identified the wind termination shock as the most favorable site for cosmic ray exploration. And the details are there in this paper. And the reasons uh, are very uh, uh, clear that because the wind termination shock is very strong, the Mach number can be much uh, of the order of five or more, even for a small cluster like thousand solar mass cluster where there are only 10 uh, OB stars. So the NOB is the number of OB stars. Uh, it can be five, and the Mach number increases with uh, uh, the cube root of uh, the NOB. So for large clusters, it can be much larger. So they're uh, good sites for, but this is only true for compact clusters. So that also something we, we discovered. Compact means five, six. Um, it also means that they're young clusters because clusters slowly expand because they're losing gas all the time. That's robbing them of the uh, gravitational potential energy. So they're young, massive, and compact star clusters are good sites for uh, uh, cosmic ray acceleration. So uh, we uh, wanted to attack the neon problem, but then that gets very complicated because then you have to use stellar wind yields, uh, which depends on various assumptions of uh, rotation speed of stars. So for example, this is 20 neon, 22 neon, and the neon 22 to neon 20 ratio for different, uh, uh, so, uh, wind material is black and the SN ejector, the supernova ejector is in gray. Um, and, and this is a function of time, as a function of stellar mass. Uh, and then we also have to uh, take into account uh, the supernova shocks uh, inside the cluster because they will also keep going off and um, it, it becomes very complicated. So now uh, I'll show on the results of only one day simulation. Uh, before I get into that, uh, let me tell you that you know, there, there have been one solution that has been discussed in the literature that uh, supernova, uh, the neon problem can be solved by supernova shocks because they're going to go within the stellar wind of the progenitor stars. And we know that the stellar wind is enriched in neon 22, so supernova shocks can do the job of accelerating 22 neon and then increase the ratio. But there is a severe problem with this uh, picture, and uh, which is not, uh, we found, uh, we discovered that. So to get to that, let me set the stage by looking at only supernova remnants in standard story of supernova remnants in IS shocks. Um, this is a picture that says a lot of things, but you can ignore. I'll, uh, I'll just point out the things that we need to know. Um, this is uh, about 2,000 years, a uh, snapshot about 2,000 years after a supernova has gone off. Uh, in, uh, in, this is in, in radius. Uh, light blue shows the uh, ambient ISN material. Light red shows the SN ejector. And so if I uh, come in from outside in, so you'll see this is the forward shock, this is a density jump, and then the two kinds of material are facing in the contact discontinuity here. This is, this is the uh, supernova reverse shock. And the red uh, marks here uh, are, uh, denote the Mach numbers, uh, which can be read off from the right and uh, uh, Y axis, uh, and it shows that you know this is of the order of 200, which is the standard stuff. On the bottom panel, what is uh, being plotted is the swept up mass per unit time. Uh, red uh, is for supernova ejector, blue for ambient uh, material. So this is the uh, this is per unit time, and on the right hand side is the uh, integrated over time. And this is swept up energy, uh, basically the energy flux uh, to the shock surface, and so you can think of this as uh, the blue line is going to tell you the amount of shock energy that is being processed by ambient material, and the red, the amount of shock energy that is being processed by supernova ejector. Right? As you can see, I, we know the standard story that you know, the ambient material is being accelerated in much more abundance than the supernova ejector. Then I'll, this is the case of supernova going on in a stellar wind. All right. So in the stellar wind, so there are two pictures here. One is right after the first supernova has gone up, and this is 300 years later. Um, as the supernova has gone off in the stellar wind, so you see this wind termination shock here. There's the supernova forward shock here, and this is light cyan is for wind material. Again, light red is for supernova ejector, and this is supernova uh, reverse shock. And as they go, as I've shown in the uh, uh, simulations, uh, animations, the uh, wind termination shock gets disturbed with the 
supernova shock hits. And then you can see that the reverse shock becomes very strong because the, uh, the red color for the Mach number of the reverse shock has become of the order of six or seven. And that becomes very important. Look at the um, energy that is being processed by different kinds of material. Green for stellar wind material, um, uh, um, deep blue for ambient ISM, and red for um, uh, supernova ejector. The, the, the energy, the shock energy, amount of shock energy that is processed by stellar wind material, and the amount of energy that is uh, processed by uh, the super, uh, supernova ejector. Supernova ejector is much, much more. So the, basically the reverse shock is, cannot be ignored in this case, and which has been ignored by these proponent uh, um, uh, advocates of who want to solve the new problem by just the supernova sh uh, shocks in the wind. So what is going to happen is a reverse shock is going to accelerate this uh, supernova ejector, but that is 20, neon 20 rich, and it's going to reduce the ratio. So it doesn't work. What works, is uh, is the stellar wind material, the compact cluster, and the wind termination shock. So this is a picture again, and this is a sort of broken in, uh, this is the inner region, this is the outer region, and you can see this is the inner 20 parsec, this is the uh, outer region. So this is again ambient uh, ISM, light blue, and coming in from outside inwards, this is the forward shock, and uh, inside you'll have the stellar wind material, again, wind termination shock, supernova forward shock, supernova reverse shock, but within the reverse shock now you not only have supernova ejector light red, but you also have the continuously being pumped uh, uh, light cyan of uh, 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 stellar wind material. So that's a mixed color of gray. Anyway, so let's look at the shock energy that is being processed by two uh, these three different kinds of material. Now you'll see that the green color for the wind material, the, 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 the shock energy that is being uh, processed by wind material is much, much more than the red, which is the supernova ejector, right? And it's a factor of uh, about six or so, and that depends on uh, how compact the cluster is. Before I go into the next one, we just pointed out one thing that you can see that the stellar, uh, the wind termination shock, which starts from here to the contact viscosity somewhere here, it's of the order of, uh, it's very large. I would like you to remember that it's of the order of, you know, 50 parsec or so. Okay, we'll come back to this uh, aspect. This is going to be important. So, uh, 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 if you uh, if you compare by either wind material and the supernova ejector material, we can write down these two ratios. So, this is two ratios being plotted here as a function of time. Um, green for wind material, red for supernova ejector, and thick lines for compact clusters, thin line for loosely bound clusters. Uh, compact, I mean, when the core radius is less than five parsecs. Uh, and so we have these uh, ratios. And once we have these ratios as a function of time, we can then use the stellar wind uh, uh, data yield. So we know how much of uh, neon 22 is coming out as a function of time, as a function of mass. We just weight them, uh, give the proper weightage, the how much of uh, stellar wind, uh, neon 22 in stellar wind is going to be accelerated, how much of 22, neon 22 in supernova ejected uh, uh, is going to be accelerated. And so that gives you the ratio of instantaneous ratio of neon 22 to neon 20. And then you can find out the time average. Uh, this is sort of has been discussed in Franco's paper. And this is the final result we have as a function of time. Uh, the, this is the neon 22 to neon 20. Gray is a line shows the solar ratio and the thick uh, black line shows the uh, observed ratio is five times. And so these are the, you know, nuclear synthesis will depend on a lot of uh, assumptions. For example, uh, the assumption uh, uh, beyond what sort of mass, uh, stellar mass would you have black hole as a remnant and uh, not neutron stars. So these are the three different uh, assumptions. Also assumptions of uh, rotations in speed. So pink is for no rotation, green is for uh, uh, 300 kilometer per second, blue for 150 kilometer per second. The point is that with this, uh, if you ignore the uh, zero rotation uh, curves, we can actually get the neon 22 to neon 20 ratio uh, to the observed level. And it's not a phenomenological ad hoc ratio. This is a priori calculation. Um, so it increases uh, slowly um, because uh, initially, so because most of the neon 22 is coming out just before the supernova stage in the stellar wind of massive stars. And that happens around 
this is the five to 10 mega years. And after 10 mega years, you hardly have those uh, massive stars anymore. So that uh, uh, the, the ratio stays fixed or, or slightly declines. So let me take a step back and see what have we done. Um, what we have done is to have brought in the wind termination shock into the picture. Uh, but is that something very uh, uh, unexpected? Um, but it's not because massive stars produce supernova and massive stars are also born in clusters. Uh, massive stars are hardly ever born in isolation. In isolation. So you expect uh, wind term, uh, uh, stellar winds, you expect the wind termination shock to be at work. And so what we have done is to not to have ignored the vigorous youth of stars uh, and just talk about the catastrophic end of uh, the supernova explosions. So it's not uh, a paradigm shift. It's just, uh, uh, I think, gives a more complete picture. And I think it's, it's a more satisfying picture. To have, uh, but um, I, I, um, some of you might say that, you know, uh, what about supernova remnants? We see the supernova remnants just in isolation. Well, there's a cluster luminosity function. There are small clusters, there are big clusters. And the cluster luminosity function goes as NOB to the power minus two. So individual may represent the tip of the cluster uh, luminosity function where you have only one or two, uh, less than two OB stars. And if you uh, take a simple ratio uh, of one to two, how many uh, numbers uh, you know, of the clusters you have, uh, the fraction and one to uh, the upper limit, and then you'll get a factor of half, which means half the clusters would uh, are likely to give rise to isolated supernova remnants. So what you've done is nothing uh, uh, great, but, it's, it's actually a subversive move. Uh, uh, and bringing in uh, wind termination shock actually compels us to reconsider many core ideas. And let me tell you how. Let's look at the first, again, the uh, energy the, uh, uh, argument. Here is a, a, a plot of the fraction of the energy in wind termination shock. And um, um, so there are two types of shocks here in the cluster. You have both supernova shock and wind termination shock and it's a function of time. So initially, before any supernova goes off, uh, you only have wind termination shock. So the fraction is one. And then and slowly, uh, as more and more supernovae uh, 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 go off, it, uh, the fraction decreases, depending on, this is from Starburst, and depending on different uh, assumptions of stellar nucleosynthesis, um, stellar uh, evolution model. But this ratio never goes below a quarter. See, this is about 0.25. And in fact, this, is, this fraction can be more than half if you consider very young clusters, say less than 10 uh, uh, mega years young. So I think we can say that you know, wind termination shocks can contribute to about a quarter of all galactic cosmic rays. Um, let me give you the argument in a different way. Um, I told you that the typical mechanical power of stellar winds is 10 to the power 36 arcs per second. And within about this solar circle, there are about 200,000 OB stars. And so that uh, uh, makes about 200, two times 10 to the power 41 arcs per second. By the way, uh, the similar energetic arguments have been also by, made by Kang and Ryu, although they did talk about the neon uh, ratio, but the energy arguments are there. Now, if this represents a quarter, the rest of the three quarters must come from the supernova shocks. So that must be uh, six times 10 to the power 41 arcs per second. And if you say that 10 to the power 51 arcs for each supernova, that will immediately give you a rate of two supernova per century, which is exactly what you see from, say, aluminum 26 uh, measurements. And then in, if you add these two, you'll get a total cosmic luminosity. Say 10% of that is eight times 10 to the power 40 arcs per second, which is exactly what is inferred. I mean, I remember I told you that cosmic luminosity is of the order of 10 to the power 41 arcs. That was an approximate uh, figure. So it fits in, right? So, um, but it does something more because remember the shock wind region is large, right? Compared to this thin shell that you see in supernova remnant, you know, the picture that I showed earlier once. And uh, so the larger the size of the accelerating region, it allows this cosmic rays to be accelerated to uh, higher energy. I just looked at the time because you know, the Hillas argument says, um, which is something to do with, um, you can argue, say, the llama radius should, uh, should be comparable to the uh, uh, accelerating size, or you can also say the acceleration time scale and the dynamical time scale of the object. Anyway, if you take a magnetic field of, say, 10 microgauss and the stellar wind uh, speed of about uh, 2,000 kilometers per second, you can get up to a few times Z times PV. 
it, this is a, a figure from September Totem's paper in 2016, looking at the cosmic ray um, flux, um, the energy spectrum, it's multiplied by E cubed. So to bring out the small undulations, uh, uh, make it more uh, in contrast. So the, this is the knee and this is the ankle. So don't uh, worry about the right hand side because that's uh, the cosmic rays of those energy has to come from extraterrestrial sources. But, <clears throat> sorry, this also shows they found out that in a supernova, cannot explain all the galactic sources. I mean, uh, uh, say it and beyond a few PEVs, it's very difficult to explain with supernova uh, accelerated cosmic rays. And um, there you will see the, in the literature whether the cosmic rays can accelerate into PEV or tens of PEV depends a lot on the assumptions of magnetic field uh, enhancement. Um, but here it's very simple because the uh, shock to wind region is large and it has the potential of solving the problem of the second galactic component that seems to be required beyond the knee uh, to ankle. Uh, something more, For uh, the, is, since the shocked wind region is large, um, we can find out the residence time, uh, we can from, uh, from this cosmic diffusion of the order of a mega year. And so we can also estimate the grammage accumulated in the shocked shell. And that turns out to be of 10 gram per centimeter squared. That's exactly what you need for cosmic ray uh, propagation. So again, so this looks like this is the uh, uh, materialization of uh, the nested leaky box model ideas that the gram H is actually being accumulated inside this stellar wing, uh, the nests. Uh, and so the gram H can be decoupled from cosmic ray propagation in ISN. Right? So, um, uh, in the next few minutes, um, I don't know, how, how am I doing in time? Um, you have uh, another um, 10, 12 minutes at least. Okay, so, so in the next few minutes, I'd like to be uh, more speculative. Uh, so this is work in progress. So some of you might be wondering, what about the biggest success story of the, uh, the Gramage cosmic ray propagation, the uh, interstellar medium, which has to do with the explaining, explanation of the diffuse galactic gamma ray background. Right. And uh, in that picture, we have the diffuse nature of the background coming from the cosmic ray propagation in the interstellar media. Of course, it's, it's not a, a totally success story because there is uh, an unexplained uh, excess. Almost half of the observed GV emission is unaccounted for. But what if what we are saying is correct, then there is a problem, right? Now you're saying that the most of the gamma rays, most of the cosmic ray interactions happen not in wild cosmic rays uh, propagate in the interstellar medium, but inside the stellar wind uh, bubble. Now, so that that's changes the picture fundamentally. Uh, I, and the question is, how do you then explain the uh, diffuse uh, um, gamma ray background? Well, uh, so this is something that I'm uh, working on right now. Um, what we have done is to take in the, uh, into account the spatial distribution OV association and looking at from the solar position, looking at the inner galactic region, um, we find that the sky coverage, the filling factor in sky uh, is much, much more than uh, one, which means every line of sight is going to intercept one bubble or another. And then something interesting happens. If you look at the bubble sizes, the, the wind bubbles uh, stall when the expansion speed becomes comparable to the ambient sound speed, right? Uh, these are also seen in H1 studies as super bubbles. Um, and I have been uh, sort of uh, uh, wondering about the size distribution of the super bubbles uh, as uh, seen in H1 studies. And uh, so it was initially uh, explained by O.A. and Clark back in 1997, assuming uh, adiabatic expansion of uh, stellar wind bubbles. So we took into account radiative processes and uh, which changes the physics a little bit, but the result is interest, uh, similar. And what you find is that the size of the bubble, if you just say that the wind expansion speed uh, becomes comparable to the sound speed of the ambient medium, the wind bubble uh, scales as, uh, this is the mechanical power of the wind to the power the square root of that, which means L is proportional to R square. And we know that the luminosity function of clusters it goes as L to the power minus two, and then you can actually work out the size distribution of the H1 holes, and that would go as uh, R to the power minus three, which is exactly what is observed in, uh, say, for example, Thing survey. This is an example of a face-on galaxy, which is, and you can see the H1 holes. Um, so the Thing survey has 
confirm that the uh, uh, size distribution goes as r s to the power minus three, which means this is correct. They, the size of the wind bubble uh, um, scale as um, mechanical power to the uh, power of half. And this is our uh, study. This is uh, I've done something uh, uh, simulation with uh, a project student from ISR Kolkata, Pushpita Das, and uh, Sally Oe. Uh, this is including radiative processes, radiative cooling, um, and we see that the you know, size distribution is uh, pretty close to R to the power minus three. So, what you remember, I said that the conversion factor of gamma ray, uh, uh, the wind mechanical power to the gamma ray, is of the order of 0.1 percent to a percent, and now which means that the gamma ray luminosity is proportional to R square, which means what? L to the power, divided by four pi R square, which is the surface brightness of star clusters, is the same. Which means a star cluster can be near or far, can be small or big, doesn't matter, the surface brightness is the same. And then you can immediately find out the surface, uh, the, if this should cause the diffuse, uh, what would be the diffuse intensity? And the diffuse intensity here, I have taken the lowest uh, 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 the uh, conversion factor to the power minus three, and just uh, use this conversion factor of L and R S, which I find from just interstellar physics, you know, um, and that gives me a diffuse flux which is comparable. So this is the uh, flux and GV uh, from Fermilab towards the inner galactic region, and this is about a quarter. This is about 4 to the power, uh, my, 10 to the power minus 2 MeV uh, per centimeter square per second per steridian. The day I did this estimate, I literally fell off the chair. I mean, this is so surprising that I didn't assume anything. I just, uh, this is simple interstellar physics. And what I use is a, 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 it's a conversion factor. Um, and the surprising uh, result that you know the, all the surface brightness of the star cluster should be the same. Anyway, so this is I'm going to stop here and uh, summarize what I've said. So I think I have well I've tried to convince you that the wind termination shocks uh, can be important and can account for at least a quarter, if not more, of all galactic cosmic rays. And adding wind termination shock to supernova shocks in ISM is a natural extension of the standard paradigm because then you take into account what has happened to the massive stars um, throughout its lifetime and not just talk about its catastrophic end uh, as a supernova. And uh, by doing that, we can solve many problems by decoupling the grammage from cosmic ray propagation in the interstellar medium like light event problem. And it also solves the neon problem, um, isotope problem, and uh, can also explain the excess uh, uh, diffuse GV gamma ray background and may even solve uh, the uh, required the second component uh, uh, problem for the galactic uh, cosmic rays. I think I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. Great, Biman. That's a staggering talk. That's wonderful. Uh, I uh, thank you, you, thank you, you digest. Um, all the implications. Uh, we have hands up already. Uh, Rituban, let's go first. Rituban, go and ask your question. Rituban, did I unmute you? Go on, ask your question. Hello, can you hear yeah, me? Go ahead. Yes, yes, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, I uh, sorry, I, I might have missed it. Uh, so, if uh, the wind termination shock, I mean, stellar wind uh, termination shock is uh, accelerating uh, cosmic rays, uh, I mean, do you expect uh, just gamma ray emission from such stellar winds? And has there been observation of uh, such high energy like X rays or gamma rays from? Yes, yes. So, that was the actually starting point that we see gamma rays from stellar winds, uh, uh, the star forming regions. So, so let me go back uh, to the, the observations. So this is, uh, this is what I showed. So this is the Fermi uh, lat uh, observation of Cygnus region. Uh, this is in the infrared, this is in gamma ray. So you do see gamma rays. And so the idea is that, uh, uh, so we took into account all possibilities, uh, cosmic accelerating from forward shock, 
to wind termination shock, maybe in the central region. But the best explanation comes out when you accelerate cosmic rays from the uh, wind termination shock. And most of the gamma rays actually come from the from the shell, interacting in the in the dense shell. Okay, thank you. Okay, next, uh, let's go, Indra. Unmute. Bivanda, uh, very good yes. talk. Thank yes. you. So uh, uh, I have a question about the uh, about the numerics you have used. Uh, you use you are using a two fluid, right? So is this a yes. two fluid that uh, Becker and Kazanas actually uh, yes. proposed? It's like yes. a thermal fluid, and then you have a non-thermal fluid. Yes. So uh, I asked this question with to the, Becker again. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Please. And, and there's a, the, uh, the cosmic ray fluid has diffusion. Okay, so uh, so uh, the, this cosmic ray part, what, what do they what what equations do they follow? At four point adiabatic index. Sorry, I, I uh, the, the, the adiabatic oh, indices are different. Adiabatic okay. indices are different. But basically, they are two fluids, right? I mean, just uh, basically the two behave like thermal fluid. What I mean to say is that they behave like two the thermal fluid. fluids and uh, with two one different, with different uh, adiabatic indices, but one uh, cosmic rays are also allowed to diffuse. Okay, okay, all right. But I think, uh, I, I hope Siddharth is there. He may be able to, uh, because he wrote the code. Um, yes, I, I, I saw Siddharth there. Is, uh, can he unmute and, and, uh, and respond? I have asked him to unmute. I have un unmuted him. Yes. Yeah. Yes. She does to go ahead. Yes. I guess his mic is not working. No. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, the question is in the in the uh, code in the code. But how we how did you co codify it? Is it two fluids, one with a certain gamma which is five third, another is uh, certain gamma, whatever the gamma is, and you have a diffusion term with that co yeah. uh, with that fluid? Is is that what that's what I gathered from uh, Bimanda's uh, response? I think he has a problem in connectivity. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So we can go okay, come then, back to yeah. him uh, if we, if we yeah. do that. Okay. Let's yeah. go to Indra. Uh, Indra, yeah. let's go to uh, um, uh, yeah. Indulekha's question. Okay. So yeah, Indulekha, sure, sure. go ahead and ask your question. Uh, I just had uh, two small things to uh, say. Uh, one is in one of the, I think, sixth or seventh slides, there was a picture showing uh, gamma ray emission along with, uh, I think, X ray emission. One was in red and one was in blue. It looked like uh, the, the emission was like two spheres, one shifted with respect to the other rather than one inside the other. Uh, uh, is there any comment on that uh, in light of this particular picture? The other is you in between somewhere you just passingly said starburst. If you look at the 30th door, which is supposed to be the nearest starburst, the O stars are sort of all over the place rather than uh, in a compact configuration. So uh, the idea of compactness was stressed. Uh, does it make any difference? Yeah, uh, the, the, you know, even if you look at the Cygnus uh, region, it's, it's a very complicated structure. Um, uh, and so what we have is the theoretical uh, you know, uh, idealized uh, model of uh, a compact cluster, but there are compact clusters um, um, uh, embedded in molecular clouds. 30 dollars is slightly better than this. Uh, this is Cygnus region is uh, very complicated. Um, so I agree with you that the compact, uh, the idea of compact cluster um, may be somewhat idealized, but you know, while starting to do something, you know, we start with something idealized and hopefully um, 
more and more details and complications will be uh, can be added later. Uh, to the other question about the uh, the relative positions of gamma ray and X ray, I'm not sure I know the answer. You, you say the the red and blue are slightly shifted from one another. So the blue is uh, Chandra, I think, and then the red is no, no uh, I think. Red is the Chandra and the blue is the TV from Hess. Um, I think they are taken as the signatures of uh, acceleration of cosmic rays in the shell. Um, so you'll see the limb brightening kind of thing. Beyond that, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what to say. Uh, I was wondering whether shouldn't it be one color inside the other? That's all. Oh, than one the, the, oh, the high energy, uh, the gamma rays are probably coming from the high energy, um, higher energy cosmic rays, which are going to diffuse out. Uh, there's also the resolution problem. They're not from the same resolution here. Okay. The detectors. That's a great topic. Thank you. Great, uh, Dipanjan, go ahead. Hi, Viman, uh, fantastic yeah. talk. Still trying to Thank wrap you. my head over all the different implications. Uh, so, uh, but uh, quickly, I want to- to. <laughs> <laughs> we also try to uh, <laughs> digest what we've done. <laughs> yeah, I had uh, I have been aware of Siddharth's paper before this, but uh, this is the first time I heard all of the results together in one go. So it was very nice to hear them. I had a quick question regarding the wind termination shock because you know uh, uh, with Naveen yourself and Pratik, we also tried to look at this issue with the super bubble yeah. case. And yeah. what we had found in one of the results for that paper was um, uh, to form a very strong and steady wind termination shock. You required some strength of the NOB associations within a. Yes. So this is somewhat yes. related to Indu Lekha's question regarding compactness or something like that. So my question is two parts. One is, uh, does this model require a certain amount of uh, you know, uh, stars to be located in a small region and have a strong wind yes. termination shock? Secondly, yes. uh, what is the dependence on the, say, the compression ratio? Because the shock compression ratio is what is going to give you the acceleration. So do you see a variation in terms of different uh, parameters? which would vary in realistic system when then that has implications on the last part of your talk where you're trying to explain the diffuse background because not all of the star clusters would be of the similar type. Yeah, so the wind termination shock uh, can be strong. Um, so the Mach number roughly goes as uh, NOB to the power, you know, cube root of NOB. So, and it has to be compact um, in order for the Mach number to be large. If it is uh, loosely bound, it's not large. So we need uh, at least um, so at least about a you know much much more than ten, say about hundred uh, NOB stars to be uh, packed within a uh, five parsec region. I see. Um, okay. The the number that I remember from our paper, I have to look up our thousand paper, or so. Back was a bit higher than that, but thousand more distributed. So yeah. that was. That you remember that was uh, uh, so for the Clegg and Chevalier model to be yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, correct. Yeah, right, right, right. And also regarding the dependence on the Mach number or, or the compression ratio. So the compression ratio can vary. So uh, you also need. Uh, so what I was trying to say is, uh, does it depend on the nature of the stars to drive a certain compression ratio, or is just the total association? That's all. So far. What do you mean by nature of stars? Uh, like, um, what is the uh, wind output energy from individual stars and how much supernovae is going off, which would drive uh, 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 a different wind profile, let's say? So, the, we just uh, uh, considered the total uh, mechanical power of the winds, and that is remarkably uh, independent of the stellar mass. I see. Uh, even if you take this uh, Starburst 99 model, uh, so you can take 10 to the 36 pulse, but, uh, but uh, see that is, has also taken, you know, uh, as a function of mass. Uh, so if you assume an IMF, we, uh, we assume the Cooper IMF. Right. So you can ascribe by Monte Carlo, uh, we didn't say about uh, this uh, number of OB stars that you have taken, you can assign their masses and uh, mean sequence lifetime. So he has taken uh, the wind power uh, as a function of mass, as a function of time, 
and then the supernova will go off according to the main sequence lifetime that we have ascribed by this uh, IMF. Okay, okay, thanks. thanks. The limitation is, let me <laughs> tell you the limit. This is, uh, this is a 1D uh, uh, simulation. So, so um, maybe there are, uh, 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 because uh, going uh, beyond this is uh, computationally uh, challenging. So that's something to do with in future. Okay, thanks. Going beyond one. Great. Uh, Shiddhartha was, uh, was uh, written in chat box, uh, Indranil, uh, uh, a response to your question. He said that um, his internet is unstable, but uh, in his model, he can say that there are two energies, gas and uh, cosmic energy are, are separate and they evolve separately. And he's given a reference in there, if you want to see. Um, KP Singh next. KP has a question. Hello, uh, Vivan, this is about neon. Uh, see, uh, neon is something <clears throat> special about neon This not seen, in, for example, in the sun and only in the yes. uh, solar wind. So I was wondering yes. what is special about neon that, uh, or the acceleration process that en enhances neon in the winds, if you know anything about that. And oh, I, I, I uh, was not aware about this still a solar wind. Neon is by hand from observations of winds and no way and so on, and wind dominated sources. So it's something in okay. the acceleration process that does this beyond. So what we thought is that uh, I did, I'm not aware of this uh, solar wind, uh, neon in solar wind. Uh, so people have noticed that you know neon 22 is um, is available in pre supernova stellar wind. So mm -hmm. this. Stellar nuclear synthesis models, they uh, give you how much of uh, neon 22 and neon would come out as a function of time from different stars, uh, depending on. So we just use that. Uh, uh, beyond that, I don't know what is special about neon. I mean, as, uh, uh, as far as this uh, stellar nuclear synthesis is concerned, and something probably happens with the dredging, and I don't really know. I, I don't really know. Fine. Kandu next. Kandu, go ahead. You can hear? Yes, yes Kandu, yes, yes, we can. Yeah, so very nice talk. And uh, it you. was very interesting to find that stellar wind termination shocks will also do something uh, which. I'm just wondering about your emphasis about this 50 parsec size accelerating higher energy cosmic ray particles. Now, if I want to compare with supernova versus stellar wind, firstly, there would be the Mach number uh, of the shock. Secondly, there'll be the magnetic field which you are adopting. Of course, if all things are equal, then the size will come into the picture. So I was just sure. trying to understand uh, sure. So, what you, you say that you're absolutely right. Is the, is the product of uh, magnetic field, uh, the the speed, and the size that matters? Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. So uh, and yes, yeah, so, yeah. So I was just wondering. And for the supernova case, hmm. uh, since the size is small, they have to bank on the magnetic field to be enhanced yes. um, by a great amount, hmm. and uh, we don't need that. Since the size is large, even with the ten micro gauss, uh, you know, and the speed is large, you get uh, your mark too number that much you need is enough. Yes, uh, yes. The mark yes. number that you get is sufficient. Yes. Okay, great. It's so nice this idea. is something that uh, I, I'm, I just said. I, I said, you know, it has the potential of uh, solving. This is something that I would like to do next because there actually. It has uh, put us in a situation where there are a lot of things to do. Um, so uh, diffuse gamma ray background is something that I thought I'd first to take a crack at. This is something that uh, also interesting, I mean, to see whether uh, we can really get, uh, explain this uh, gap in the cosmic ray uh, spectrum. Yeah, yeah it's uh, pretty interesting to, <laughs> to think about. Yeah, thanks a lot, thanks. Very interesting talk, Biman. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Thank you. Um, and, and so, uh, and also on the YouTube channel, there are uh, about a dozen people, but 
I don't see any other questions there either. So thank you again. And uh, um, it's, it's our appreciation. We can't clap here. There is a, a clap button that people can press to show that they're clapping. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> In Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much indeed, Vima.